I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick. As clinicians, we have a unique vantage point on the human experience, but we don't always have time to reflect on our experience. Involvement in the arts gives us the opportunity to both create meaning, to find meaning, and sometimes to forge meaning out of what we do. When I talk about the arts, I like to think about it broadly. Poetry, stories, song, dance, paintings, drawings, anything that we as people, as friends, as colleagues can come together and enjoy experiencing with each other and use as a means of finding meaning in what we do and and in life. And tonight, we are privileged to have Dr. Seema Yasmin join us. Dr. Yasmin is the director of the Stanford Health Communication Initiative and a clinical assistant professor in the Stanford Department of Medicine. She's also the author of four books, including a really wonderful recent book of poems, If God is a Virus. Seema, welcome. Thanks for having me, Neil. Seema, can I ask you to read the poem that we had talked about for our audience? Of course. This is a poem called Anamnesis. My patient is the same age as me, 27. Same complexion, golden brown, same postcode, E8. Chief complaint, patient presents with five-week history of intermittent blurred vision, neck pain, headaches, and vomiting. My patient is a DJ, spins lover's rock, dance hall, sometimes a little bit of house and garage in clubs in Hackney and Essex. Past medical history, unscarred, fine too. Grew up in the ends without getting stabbed or shot. Ordinarily, I would ask you for your digits, he says, straightening a pretend collar on his diaphanous white hospital gown. Ordinarily, I think, what a word, what a world. But since we're here, ordinarily we would meet somewhere near the DJ booth. Who am I kidding? We'd meet behind it. Ordinarily, I would let you drape your arm around my neck. Ordinarily, we'd dance to a Barris Hammond tune and hold hands. Did swims at the Reebok gym tone your frame up? Family history. Ordinarily, he would live to 87 like his grandpops, the one in Kingston, the one on his mum's side. The one who Amber Rudd sent back on a reverse wind rush, but said he went of his own volition. Said he would not be buried in dirt that could not sprout mango trees. I drape my stethoscope around my neck Fiddle with the diaphragm, finger the metal bell, scroll up and down the CT scan, up and down, we wait. Family history. His mother loves him. She loves him so, so much. Right now, she is driving through the congestion zone to find out what is wrong with her baby boy. Why did he wind up in accident and emergency on a Tuesday morning? We wait for his mother, and when she walks onto the ward, I say the thing a five-syllable thing. And she collapses onto my pinafore. Brown goddess locks spill onto my face, over my right shoulder. And from his bed, he says, mum, mum. So I too say, mum, mum. In the doctor's lounge, I brew tea because this is what we do. Brits, doctors, at times of crisis. War, divorce, brain tumors in brains as young as our own. His mum collapsed on me, I tell another doctor, like on me, on me. I sip tea because this is what we do. You look sad, the male doctor says, stirring. Then, perhaps you're not cut out for this job, not cut out for clinical medicine. Perhaps you're not cut out for this job, you fucking robot, I say. But not really. Really, I sip tea because... This is what we do when the word, the world, is ending and there is to be no more ordinarily. Seema, that's an amazing poem. And as you're reading that, I'm actually thinking of uh, some of the residents that I've worked with this week on our hospital service Mm -hmm. where we've seen some really challenging things. And their sensitivity um, 
as expressed so similarly to the sensitivity that you have in this poem uh, really is something that I'm always in awe of. Can you discuss for us the meaning of this poem for you? So I wrote this a decade or so after that encounter, and I think I almost needed that much space and distance and time between the encounter just in order to give myself permission to reflect. It had been so ingrained in me that this is not a thing that we do. Encounters like the one in the poem, encounters very similar to that one, and then other very less blatant, layered ways that we were reminded in a way to be robotic. To I mean, one, one of the definitions of the word clinical is detached. And I discussed mm-hmm. that in another page in this poetry book. Um, so for me, poetry gave me an opportunity and license to reflect in a way that I could not back then. And I'm glad we have language now for some of the problems that we encounter, some of the challenges. We talk about compassion fatigue and moral injury and burnout. And I didn't have that language um, back when I was 27 and first practicing. So I just thought I was inadequate in some ways and didn't realize that actually I was fully adequate and competent. The system was broken and the system was asking me to be detached in a way that I don't think made me the best advocate or best care of my patients. But it's pretty amazing because when we think about medicine, really the origin of medicine comes out of empathy, right? We want to help someone because we care about them. And then traditionally, we've had to be detached from that care in order to provide it. Can you talk, we only have a few minutes um, left, but can you talk a little bit about what the arts in general and perhaps writing and reading poetry might provide for us, the promise it holds for us as clinicians? The arts, literature, storytelling, all of those are really powerful ways to reconnect us with those foundational sentiments and motivations that pushed us to be doctors and PAs and nurses and techs and put us in that role of caring for people and meeting people at their most vulnerable. I remember when I was in medical school, my mom, very atypical South Asian parent said, what a strange profession you're choosing where you want to have autonomy over people when they are so vulnerable. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, that's one way of thinking about it. And there's so much of what we do that sometimes is counterintuitive. And yet we don't always get to have conversations about that or feel like there's permission and literature opens that door. And whether it's, you know, losing yourself in a book, a poem, a a piece of music, whether it's opening a journal and writing something that no one's ever going to read, or whether it is publishing something and encouraging these public discussions like you and I are having, I think it's really important we bring humanities and the arts into medicine. I love that. In many ways, again, hearing your poem helps me refine that caring. Uh, I think it was Francis Peabody said, patients don't care how much they know, you know, until they know how much you care. Yeah. And using literature as a way of refining that that yeah. core meaning in what we do. Seems as I'm listening to you, I, I am leaving this discussion inspired. Oh, good. I'm glad. And, you know, we've done a really strange thing over the centuries perhaps in terms of this artificial divorcing of the humanities and arts and literature from medicine and I hope we're now recognizing that that doesn't serve us it doesn't help us have fulfilling careers um it leads to burnout and it's not necessarily the best for our patients either so here's to more literature more humanities in medicine I agree with you it's a pleasure talking with you thanks for joining us at Medscape Seema thanks Neil And for Medscape, thank you all for joining us talking about the humanities. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick.